thank you for organizing this meeting, which has been postponed, of course, for many years, as we all know, but now we are all together. And I'm particularly uh, looking forward to people I don't know and see how the reaction they have to what we do here, and in particular to astrophysics, because uh, one thing I want to do in the next years, the couple of years uh, left my scientific career, is to go to astrophysics. And so it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, I hope that there are many, I don't know all of you, of course, and I hope there are many astrophysicists in the community which we, with whom we could interact. Uh, but most of the talk will still be related to uh, lab experiments. So, um, <laughs> but I try to, okay, give some overview. I was asked to give some introduction. So some of the slides will be uh, very well known to the expert in the field, but uh, okay, I, I will see what I can do. So <clears throat> basically what we have uh, specialized in this for the last 20 uh, years and more uh, is to uh, see what happens if you have large systems of cold atoms. So this is our working horse. Typically, we, we trap many, many atoms, uh, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 atoms. And uh, because you have many atoms, it's not that you have many more of the same signal, but you have new emerging uh, uh, laws uh, coming out of the system. And so typically, what I speak about is uh, my, uh, my favorite topic, which is under -local localization of light and thicker sub and subradiance. And I will not talk about this today. So. Uh, uh, most people who have seen me talking is about this topic, and this will be completely uh, absent today. So I have to focus on something else, which is a little bit a challenge for me, because this I know exactly what I, what I have in mind, and this is a little bit more uh, uh, exploration for me. So also something I will not speak about today is about self-organization if you have some uh, uh, half-cavity retroflexion system. So I will not speak about this, which is also very nice, and you see emerging phases coming out if you have sufficient number of atoms. I will not speak about these two topics. I will speak about uh, the topics, uh, three topics uh, below here. Uh, one is what happens uh, uh, if you have many atoms and they are coupled by multiple scattering, so uh, radiation pressure uh, uh, makes these atoms interact, and what happens? So that's, that's uh, most of the talk I will focus on this. And then I will also uh, discuss uh, another topic which is connected to random lasing. So this has to do with the motion of the atoms, and this has to do with the internal degrees of freedom of the atoms. So not the motion, but how the atoms uh, jump up and down uh, in, the, in the energy spectrum. Maybe I will speak a little bit about Levy flights, but I'm not so sure I have time to do this. And uh, 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 the, the newest topic uh, is actually now reaching out to astrophysics, and we have developed a new tool, uh, well, a new tool. Uh, it's a tool which is more than 50, 60 years old, uh, intensity correlations developed by Henry Baum and Twist. But we revived this topic, and now we hope to do new science with uh, intensity correlation in uh, optical telescopes uh, across the world. And uh, this, of course, is uh, very exciting for us who have small mirrors. If you see the big mirrors, this is really amazing to, to work with. OK, so uh, the outline of the talk here will be, uh, first I will speak about optical forces, as I said, and I will give a small overview on things which are known to the experts, and then uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the experiments we have done in this, about this radiation pressure effects I just uh, uh, mentioned. And then I will uh, uh, just flash a few slides here on things we did not do, but I like very much, which other people have done, and I think there's still lots of things to be done uh, if you look at collective uh, optical dipole forces. And then I will speak about this random lasing and intensity correlation uh, and see what we can do, and as I said, level flights maybe. Okay, so uh, what is well known? So we know that if you th throw photons on atoms, the atoms will be pushed, uh, the, the atom absorbs the photon, gets a recoil, emits the photon in a random direction, and on average it will move around, it moves in the direction of the laser beam, and this gives you a, a rotation pressure force, which we typically write like this, so it depends on the direction of the laser beam, K, and it depends on the intensity of the laser, and it depends if you detune the laser out of or in of the resonance of the atomic resonance. And so this force here, this optical force here is uh, well known from, from Kepler, uh, they have very uh, early experiments on atomic beam deflections, and the radiation pressure force also uh, is important in the, in the size of the star. So if, if the star has radiation pressure, it has to compensate the gravitational collapse, and if you switch off radiation pressure, the star will collapse and you will form a white dwarf and something like this we want to measure at the end of, uh, of the talk, I will come back to this. But this is still a star which has some uh, fuel inside and it's burning, and so the radiation pressure uh, gives the size of the star. Then there's another type of force uh, which we can derive. So if you write everything in a clean way from the Hamiltonian, 
these two forces are in the same framework, but I already split it and make some approximations. And so one uh, other regime is uh, dipole forces, which uh, depends on the uh, gradient of the local intensity. So if you have a, a laser beam which is focused, for instance, then you have a, 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 a the intensity which is not constant, as it, I was assuming here, and then you get a, a force which depends on the gradient on the local intensity, and the, the scaling here is different, so it depends on the grading and not on the wave factor of the light beam. Uh, uh, and it goes like one over the detuning, whereas this force goes like one over the detuning square. So this typically means if you go out of resonance, far out of resonance, then this force can become much more important than the radiation pressure force. And in astrophysical context, this can be very important. Uh, most of the atoms in the universe are hydrogen atoms. And most of the radiation which is around is not exactly on the resonance of the hydrogen line. So most of the frequencies which is around are far detuned frequencies. So one question I have, I don't know, and maybe, okay, there are some experts in the room in our community who, might, who know more than me on, on this. Uh, I wonder uh, why these forces are not more considered in the astrophysical context. Radiation pressure is well included, I think, in, the, uh, in astrophysics, but I wonder why this is not more discussed. Probably because it's small and negligible, but okay, I, I didn't see a nice summary how this force should be taken into account in astrophysical context. Okay, so this is well known. This is uh, something which is well known. Uh, another thing which is, uh, should be well known to all the people working in cold atoms uh, is if you have an average force, you have fluctuation of the force, and this gives rise to heating. Okay, so the, the radiation pressure force, the heating is typically well known by most of the people. Uh, and uh, this goes like uh, if you do a, a, a multiple scattering of photons or a random walk in the momentum space, you can describe this as a diffusion coefficient. And this diffusion coefficient goes like the square of the uh, single step in momentum, delta p square, by a typical time scale. And if, it, if you try to compute this for radiation pressure force, the diffusion coefficient scales like 1 over the diffusion squared, and uh, is given by this uh, uh, step here, h bar k, the recoil of, of momentum. Okay, so this gives you some heating. If you have a, a, a plane wave pushing an atom, you also have heating coming with this, and so this is typically well known. Something which is a little bit less well known, but it should be really taken into account, is that you also have dipole force heating. So if you have a dipole force, you also have heating which is coming on top of this radiation pressure force heating, and uh, uh, this <coughs> can be uh, written again like uh, the how much do you uh, change the momentum per step and the time scale to do one step in this uh, just atom picture, for instance. And you can compute this force here, and what you can see is that this diffusion coefficient here is independent of the tuning. So this is a little bit uh, surprising. So this here, if you go out of resonance, of course you scatter less, and then you get less heating, so that's good. So we, we think you get, you get rid of heating if you go out of resonance. But this heating here is independent of the tuning. So this is something which is uh, well included and, and it's important, it's crucial if you want to uh, look at how Sisyphus cooling, the sub-recoil cooling uh, uh, de developed in the end of the 90s uh, was developed and which is present in all alkali atom uh, traps. Uh, this is included, this is why the temperature scales differently from Doppler model and uh, so this is something people typically don't know and don't, well, people know it, those who know who know, know but some people don't really realize how important this different scaling is. Okay, so uh, independent of the tuning, the heating. It's, it's really, I, I think this is really amazing. Uh, so we should not only look at average forces, which already people start doing, but also at heating. And there's a lot of funny things to be done with heating in this uh, particular when we go to col collective effects. So this is something which I think is still an open field. Look at heating when you look at dipole forces in collective e effects. Okay, so um, now I come to, uh, uh, so this should be known to everyone. It's old physics, so it's uh, nothing new from my side. But uh, I think this is not really fully considered by many people. Okay, so uh, now we'll tell you a little bit what we did in, uh, in NIST, what type of experiments we did we do when we have large shroud of cold atoms. And uh, so basically, uh, we come back to the more trivial radiation pressure effects uh, uh, which we discussed. So, <coughs> um, so we have to look how does a cold atom trap work, uh, magneto-optical crap mod, uh, and I will only consider the simplest Doppler cooling model for now, just to make it simple. So you get the uh, atoms which are uh, cooled here by, let's say, Doppler cooling, there's a friction coefficient, and there's a, a spring constant which keeps the atom in the center of the trap, and you have this heating here, and from this uh, single uh, atom type of description, you can get the size of the trap which goes like the temperature. 
Okay, so this is the Ekip partition theorem. And so the size of a cloud of cold atoms should be independent of how many atoms you put in there if you only consider this uh, single atom uh, scattering uh, model. Now there have been a couple of uh, suggestions how this can be amended if you have many atoms. And the first uh, suggestion came by uh, Jean Dalibar in, in the end of the 80s and said, oh, uh, maybe you have something where we can compress the cloud even more uh, by taking into account uh, what he called the shadow effect. So the idea is the following. So suppose you have this cloud of cold atoms and you have the two laser beams which try to make this, uh, this trap. And uh, if you have sufficient number of atoms, then this laser beam from the, from the left will be attenuated when it crosses the cloud, whereas the laser beam from the right at, for this atom here is not attenuated yet. So this means that this laser here for this atom has a stronger intensity, larger intensity than this beam. And this means that this atom here will be pushed to the center more than the atom on the other side, uh, uh, on the center here. So there's an additional compression effect due to this uh, uh, shadow effect here, which can be written like this. So it depends how, how the attenuation, how the scattering goes. So this is the scattering cross-section of the laser beam. And so you can show that uh, this additional uh, uh, compression here depends on how many atoms you have on the density of atoms. And uh, the idea is that maybe if you have enough atoms, you can compress this and this will collapse. And uh, the hope at that time was you can spontaneously form a, a, a bose einstein condensate without doing any extra thing. So that was the hope at that time. Uh, and uh, so this was similar to uh, Uppler, uh, to what uh, other uh, effects give. So we know uh, compression effects from other uh, uh, fields of physics. So first, there's a very old model of gravitational attraction by Lesage, uh, which is basically the same idea. So if you take two particles, so uh, we are two particles, and uh, there's some uh, background of fictitious particle, uh, which would uh, push me away, but you, you uh, make a shadow, so, and you have fluctuation behind, so you are pushed towards me. So a little bit like the Van der Waals forces, which are well known, but there was a model of uh, gravity by Lesage, which also gives the right scaling for the one over R squared attraction. So it's a very nice uh, uh, model uh, for gravity. So Van der Waals attraction also gives the screening of vacuum fluctuations, which make an attractive force, and uh, there was some uh, discussion about uh, how maybe ships, if you're in a rough sea, uh, uh, get attracted and they, uh, they bump into other uh, due to this screening of uh, external forces. So all this is kind of a compression effect, uh, and this works in 1 and 2D, uh, but uh, the, the situation con considered uh, for cold atoms was 3D situation, and then uh, something which has been neglected in this approach is that the photons which are attenuated, they have to go somewhere. They are rescattered. So you have to take into account the, the photons which are Rescattered, and they also will, bu will bump in the other atoms. And this rescattering force has been considered by Carl Wyman uh, in, in the 90s, and he showed that this dominates actually uh, the final effect. And this rescattering here, uh, so if, if I have uh, uh, an atom, I scatter photons and push in you, so this rescattered photon will push the atoms apart. So this gives a repulsive force between the atoms. Uh, and this, uh, the end of, uh, we have to all the calculation, this is more important for typical parameters, all parameters considered so far, basically in 3D, uh, over the compression force. So basically what happens, the re repulsion is dominant, so if you have more atoms in the trap, the trap becomes larger and not smaller. Okay? So <coughs> uh, here again, this is uh, uh, another way of describing this repulsion force. So if you have an, uh, an atom here which scatters uh, uh, light here, so the intensity scattered goes like uh, the, the scattering cross-section here, and the intensity on the second atom here decreases like 1 over R squared on the shell of intensity. And so this repulsion force goes like 1 over R squared. So it's like a Coulomb repulsion force. So you can, can define an effective charge here. So it looks like uh, a plasma uh, physics here, uh, a single component plasma uh, physics. And so you get a repulsion of the atoms. And if the atoms were cold enough, you could get crystallization. But all this has not been seen uh, in, in cold atoms. But so there's a kind of a Coulomb repulsion force here. And so this is uh, the data uh, of uh, uh, Wyman's pay, uh, group in, in the 90s. So they showed that if you have more atoms in the trap, the trap becomes larger here. And uh, at some point, there's a, a, a discrepancy. You can also get funny shapes here. You get uh, rings and uh, different structures here. We'll not go into detail. So we did a, a more de uh, we redid this experiment a little bit more carefully with how you do the imaging. And so this just to illustrate how things are. So if you have 10 to the 6 atoms here, you get a small trap here. And if you have 10 to the 11 atoms, the trap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the scaling law here is very similar to what has been predicted by this uh, uh, rescattering, single rescattering force from, from Wyman in the 90s. So this works quite well. And we just are happy that we can do this over many orders of magnitude to show how, how efficiently this works. 
Uh, for experts in the room, in cold atoms, uh, you might see that there's a slightly increased density here, and there might be a subdoppler component in the mod compared to the Doppler mod. But this is very few people know this uh, as well, but there's, there's, there's a little bit more physics in here than I will discuss, and uh, probably even more physics than I understand. So, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so, so this is, uh, okay, we are just benchmarking this, so we know what we do, it's understood, everything is well described. What we discovered at some point uh, by accident, more or less, is that uh, if we charge a large cloud of cold atoms, at some point, so this is uh, when you switch on the laser beam to uh, prep the atoms, you get more and more atoms, and at some point, the atom, atomic cloud becomes unstable. So I heard rumors uh, from other groups in, th in th those days that other groups have also seen this, and typically the advisors uh, tell the students, you are doing something wrong. Your laser is not well controlled, there's some noise, something is uh, wrong in there. So the only merit we actually have, I, I took, so this experiment was done by Guillaume Laberry, and I take him very seriously. When he tells me something, I, usually it's right. It's not an artifact of the experiment. So we, we tried to develop a model on this uh, and to see why this uh, cloud, if it's large enough, starts to oscillate, and it's not an artifact. Uh, and so you can do the Fourier analysis, you see that there are very nice frequencies. So here it's close to 50 hertz, but we can shift this frequency, so it's not related to the 50 hertz of the line. Uh, and uh, so the explanation of this, uh, <coughs> so first what we did is a systematic map. So we, s we changed the magnetic field gradient and the detuning, and uh, we find a stable phase where the model is stable, well behaved, and an unstable oscillating cloud. And so typically what people tell the students uh, uh, when they see an unstable cloud, go to larger detuning, everything behaves well. Then you have a nice cloud, you can work with this uh, without considering this type of uh, physics. But if you come close to resonance and you have enough atoms, the cloud becomes unstable. Okay, so uh, what we did is we developed a, a, a simple model, a very simple model uh, for this to explain the existence of this instability. And so uh, this comes again from this uh, uh, attenuation, this shadow effect, and from this multiple scattering. So if I look at, an, uh, I take a, what I call a one zone model, so I, I, I suppose that the density is homogeneous in the center, it's on the Gaussian, it's, uh, and uh, I look at uh, what happens to an atom at the edge of the cloud here. So from the, the left laser beam will be attenuated here, with this attenuation factor here, and there's a Zeeman shift and Doppler shift in here. The right laser beam will not have this attenuation factor, so the difference is in this numerator here, and that has opposite sign for the uh, 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 Zeeman effect and the Doppler shift. And then there's a multiple scattering uh, term here, which can be described in the 1D model uh, like this term here. So all this is uh, uh, a simple version of this shadow and uh, uh, rescattering force uh, I described before. On top of this, what you can now do is you do a, a linear stability anal uh, analysis on what happens for an atom at sitting at the edge of this cloud. And if you do this linear uh, stability analysis, you find the threshold condition uh, when this uh, 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 modulation increases. So there's a threshold in this linear stability analysis which can be written like this. And if you make some approximation, basically you can see that what happens is that if the Zeeman shift of the atom here at the edge of the cloud is of the order of the detuning, then this mod becomes unstable. So typically this means uh, if the, the mod gets larger and larger, and so some atoms get a different Zeeman shift, and at some point the Zeeman shift changes sign. The local Zeeman, and then you are not cooling, you are heating. So at the edge of the cloud, you reverse the cooling into heating, and so there's a dynamical heating effect at the edge of the cloud, and atoms go away, and then the optical depth gets smaller, the, and then the conversion uh, is no longer effective, and then they collapse again. So this is this linear stability analysis on, on the edge of the cloud. A and this uh, uh, works pretty well uh, with what our experimental observation, to first order, of course. And uh, once you do this model, then you can do a lot of math, and you can show that this is supercritical hop bifurcation. Uh, you can look at the, uh, at the, the dynamics at the edge. Uh, so there's the active motion here when the local detuning is switching shines through the force here, which is cooling in the center of the cloud is heating at the boundary of the cloud. Okay, so um, from this, uh, we made some uh, first explo uh, uh, exploration into uh, astrophysics. Uh, this oscillating clouds also exist in astrophysics, and uh, this is called cepheids. So cepheids are self-oscillating stars, 
where the mechanism of the oscillation also depends on the optical depth of the cloud. So that's called the kappa mechanism. I don't know if I have this over here. Yeah, over here, kappa. So the, uh, the explanation of the oscillation of cepheids is due to the fact that when the cloud is too large, uh, too bright, the optical depth at the edge of the cloud changes and then the radiation pressure changes. So this explains the oscillating, uh, some class of oscillating stars. And these oscillating stars, when you have the model right enough, you can uh, uh, use them as candles to measure the, uh, the distance of the, where the stars are. And then you can uh, use this to measure the, uh, the shift, the uh, red shift of the cloud. So if you know the oscillation period, you, you measure just the intensity of the stars and it's oscillating like this. So you just look at the intensity. If you have the right model, if you get good calibration, this is, has been very important in astrophysics to get the uh, calibration of the uh, uh, frequency of the relation to the intensity of the stars. And once you know this very well, you can extract the Hubble constant. So this was one of the first ways how to extract the Hubble constant uh, for the expansion of the universe uh, in what they call the local. So we, Milky Way is here, the other uh, galaxies around. So this was a, a very important, uh, and it's still a very important candle to measure the size of the universe up to some extent. So we, we still need uh, other ways how to measure the distance, the size of the universe. And so we, uh, we also try to find new candles, which are different type of stars, to measure the size of the universe at different ranges. So that's still an important challenge in, in cosmology. Okay, so this is just a mapping. So we do our experiments. We find a mechanism which is somehow connected and uh, we try to start to read uh, papers from astrophysics. So that's how, how it started. Okay, so uh, uh, then together with, uh, in the same time, uh, more or less, uh, uh, Thomas Pohl visited us uh, in Nice and uh, he developed a very nice uh, 1D simulation model to, uh, to see how we can do uh, uh, something which goes beyond this one zone model. And so this is the radial profile here. So that's the center, that's radial profile, and that's the density profile as a function of time. So you see that the uh, outer boundary is oscillating. So this recovers these oscillation modes. And there's a lot of internal structure, time spatial, spatial temporal structures inside the cloud here. So this is, uh, was at that time uh, puzzling to me and I wanted to already at that time to see if we can measure this type of things, but uh, somehow we didn't have the, the energy and the motivation, sufficient motivation to, to continue this at that time. But we came back to this later. Uh, and uh, so <coughs> as I started reading papers on astrophysics, I discussed with astrophysics colleagues and I particularly discussed with David Drevins uh, who is uh, uh, an expert on, uh, okay, uh, he's an expert on uh, intensity correlation in astrophysics. He wanted to do this for many, many years uh, because he's involved in CTA, uh, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, and he wants to use these instruments to revive Hungry One Twist type of experiment. So he was discussing many things. So he visited us in this, so we discussed, and at some point he told me something about uh, photon bubbles in uh, astrophysics, so which is a region uh, astrophysics have very extreme parameters. It's really crazy things compared to what we do in the lab. And he said, oh, there's something which we call photon bubbles in our community, which is uh, that the energy, radiation energy is so strong that it pushes away the matter uh, around some uh, accretion shock disks and so on. And then uh, the, 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 when the matter is away, the light can escape and then the matter comes back. So there's some oscillating modes around black holes, or I don't, I don't know all the details on this thing. So, and he said, but don't worry, this you can never do in, in, the, in the lab. You need, you need crazy energies to do this. And I told him, oh, cold atoms, we can push them very easily. They're so sensitive to light pressures that maybe we can do photon bubbles uh, in the lab. And so then I tried to find someone to help me to do the math on this, and this was Tito Mendonca from Lisbon. And so uh, we, we did an... Uh, uh, a model which is very similar to what the, the models uh, which are used in astrophysics. So it's, uh, so I hope astrophysics experts in the room will come to me and correct me because I will now state something which might be completely wrong, but I state it and I hope that I get corrected. So I think that's what's called the two fluid models in some uh, astrophysics models. One fluid is matter and the other fluid is light. And so now you have to couple these two fluids and this is what we do here. So this is a equation of motion for atoms. So uh, this is the forces here. And so this is like this radiation pressure force in Coulomb repulsion. Uh, okay, so this uh, pressure here, uh, how the atoms will move depends on how much light you have because radiation pressure depends on how much light you have. And then we look at the diffusion equation for light here. And the diffusion equation of light depends on the atomic density. If you have more atoms, you will do more, uh, the diffusion coefficient will be modified. 
So even though both e uh, equ equations here are lin linear in terms of uh, intensity, so there's no nonlinear optics effect, coupling these two equations gives you some nonlinear dynamics. And so if you couple these two equations and make a, a linear stability analy uh, analysis again, you find uh, oscillation threshold for intensity and atomic density where this can be either just exploding or oscillating modes of this, what we now call photon bubbles for cold atoms. So it's very similar. The idea is really stolen from astrophysics and just mapped onto cold atom physics. But it's the same idea. So, okay, so uh, now the question is, can we see this? Uh, and uh, so <coughs> the people in Lisbon, they have uh, uh, the same experiment basically as we have, a large cloud of cold atoms, and they saw an uh, unstable uh, uh, cloud of cold atoms, and they did an analysis of the profile of this uh, mod here, and then they fit it to a model coming from this photon bubble model, and they claim that this is an explanation of what they see. We are a little bit at a different scale of what, how the interpretation, but they claim this is photon bubbles. Uh, and they also have a paper how this photon bubble model now goes back to uh, dust interaction astrophysics. So, uh, uh, so now it's going for coming from astrophysics, cold, cold atoms, and back to astrophysics. So that's kind of a interaction we would be happy to have a little bit more developed. Okay, so uh, we don't fully follow this interpretation of the model. Uh, we did a very systematic, uh, painful uh, study of uh, what happens. So. Uh, we change the magnetic field gradient, the detuning. We look how our cloud is uh, stable or unstable. So we have a stable cloud. And then in the unstable regime, we have a zoo of different phases, actually. And uh, so the experiments here is uh, for different magnetic field gradients and, uh, and um, slightly different detunings. And what you see is that the cloud is, un all this is uh, unstable clouds, so dynamically uh, moving. But they look very different. You see it for at the eye, and the, you, you do a systematic analysis, they're very different. And we can uh, uh, find different phases here uh, in this uh, diagram here for different types of uh, unstable instabilities. Uh, and we also, I come back to this, we did uh, uh, 3D numerical simulation, which is quite heavy, to uh, see uh, how this works. And this is particularly important because uh, at some point here we see uh, uh, a cloud which goes into one direction, and you could, of course, obviously think that there's some misalignment in the trap. And so there's a defect which makes the breaking the asymmetry. But the simulation has the same spontaneous symmetry breaking, and there's no defect in the simulations. So these simulations are important to s at least uh, tell us that this is in agreement without a spontaneous symmetry breaking and not a defect in the experiment in this, uh, this phase here. Okay, so we did a lot of work uh, on, on this uh, to, uh, together with uh, one PhD student, Mar Marius Gadius, who's really developed all this, uh, and we try to understand how all this works. And of particular interest is this uh, regime here, where very small scales uh, appear. So uh, we are now uh, puzzled. Uh, typically, uh, where the experiments work is in this uh, regime here, the Lisbon experiment and the NIST experiment uh, 20 years ago were in this regime. But now uh, this regime here at low magnetic field gradient uh, is the one which uh, I think is the most intriguing uh, because it's less sensitive to uh, spatial invariance of the trap. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah. so this is a, a simulation here. Uh, so uh, the simulations are difficult because in the experiment we did 10 to 9, 10 to the 10 atoms. You cannot simulate this in 3D uh, uh, for simulation, so we need a super particle approach, and you need to be careful how you do the scaling, uh, but it works well. And uh, what you can see here, I can do this again, I like this so much. Uh, you see the, uh, this cloud here, uh, it's like a bird flocking cloud. So this is only repulsive interactions. Nevertheless, uh, these atoms cluster together. Okay, so there's no attractive binary forces included, only repulsive binary forces, and the uh, external potential, and you, it gives you this clustering here. So I, 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 th uh, I like this very much. I think this is very intriguing. And uh, this is something which uh, is similar to um, uh, what uh, Seifman did in the ion trap in 1D. So what he found, if you take an ion trap, you would uh, consider if you have all charged particles that these particles repel, and then you get the homogeneous distribution of the ions in the trap. What, what he found is that if you inject particles here, uh, they will uh, bunch and they will, uh, so they oscillate in the trap and they will stay together. 
which is very counterintuitive. What happens is at the edge of the trap, there's a nonlinear effect, and the faster ions, they go higher up the walls than the slower particles, and when they come back together, they stay together, and then the other side is complete again. So they, for a very long time, uh, they will stay bunched, even though there's only repulsive interaction, but the trapping force here, combined with this repulsive interaction, makes these ions stay together, which is, uh, well, I, I, when I saw this experiment many years ago, I, I thought this was a very nice experiment, probably did not get enough, get enough attention, but I, I like this very much. And so what we have now here is the same in 3D. I think we have we, the combination of this trapping, trying, so there's a, a, a boundary effect which keeps the atoms together, but the fact that atoms want to repel, repel each other, at some point they cluster again. So you don't need attractive forces to make clustering of particles if you have a, bounding, a binding potential. And so uh, we also looked into, uh, together with Sergei Nazarenko, who is an expert in turbulence, uh, how to analyze in particular this uh, uh, cloud, uh, uh, type of cloud here in terms of scaling of turbulence. And uh, I think he says this is a, 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 is a turbulent cloud, but I'm not really expert what you call turbulent or turbulent. It, it follows the right scaling laws, but I don't know exactly uh, what you classify as turbulent or not. But anyway, so we can do a lot of analysis on these clouds. What happens is that these atoms develop <laughs> A small scale structure spontaneously, only with repulsive forces, because it's also well captured with our, within our model. And, uh, and this also uh, exists in uh, astrophysical context. So people, uh, this is a well, uh, older paper here, but uh, they have, I think, what they also call, uh, I don't know if they call it a two fluid model, but there's a model for matter and there's a, a radiation energy. They couple this together and they also see uh, structures of, uh, of particles mm -hmm. here. Uh, but of course here, there's, this is the gravitational interaction which is attractive among the particles as well. So it's different from a magnetic-optical trap. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a lot of things uh, which uh, catch the eye, let's say. And so the question is, can we try to connect these uh, things and can we understand something uh, uh, using cold atom experiment in the lab into astrophysical context? That would be the, the very nice to, to develop. Okay, so... Uh, this was only radiation pressure force, whoops. Uh, now collective dipole forces. Uh, we have done nothing about collective dipole forces, but other people have done things. And uh, so the first uh, <coughs> uh, part which is uh, important to remember is what is called optical binding. So these were experiments done by uh, Jean-Marc Fournier, uh, Eugene Golovchenko and Michael Burns in, at Roland Institute at, at that time. And so what they do is they take uh, uh, beads of glass, uh, glass beads in water. They uh, take a laser beam, it's pushed up to the upper ceiling of this uh, uh, container, and then uh, the light which scatters on one bead uh, <coughs> scatters, interferes with the other, with the light coming from the laser beam, and this makes fringes. Uh, uh, and the second bead is trapped in the fringes of this uh, scattering field. And you can do a self consistent model on this. And then you see that these beads will come uh, together in steps by lambda over two lambda here. Uh, and they, they will form self-bound matter, which is called optical binding. This was in 1D. Uh, this also works in 2D. I don't know if this has been done in 3D. Uh, I think Jean-Marc told me that he tried to do 3D in Lausanne at some point, but I didn't see any papers published if this has been done in 3D. Uh, most importantly, in this setting here, these beads are in water, so there's a lot of damping. Okay, so the heating I mentioned uh, in vacuum is absent here because there's this uh, 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 water uh, damping which is crucial here and which worked very well. The question is, can you do this in astrophysical context? Can you do this in cold atoms without the uh, uh, friction by, by water? And uh, so we did a model uh, together with Romain Bachelard and his student uh, in 2D and why you used our uh, couple dipole model, something we use a lot in the recent years, how the uh, dipoles oscillate and then the radiation of these dipoles are coupled to the motion of the atoms and in 2D we found uh, that there's a, indeed a regime where you can overcome this heating uh, and you get bound states uh, for a given set of parameters here. So that's 2D, uh, just a model, uh, uh, so we have not done this in 3D. Uh, if you could do this in 3D, you could simulate on Earth a long-range attractive force, similar like gravity. That would be very nice. So if someone could simulate gravity in the lab, that would be in 3D. You could maybe mimic uh, a spiral formation and this kind of thing. That would be very neat. But okay, so we have not done this. Uh, there have been uh, 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 ex uh, simulation in 3D, and uh, I hear that maybe Helmut also has things on this. I 
I don't know all the details, but at least I know something uh, from Nicola Piovella, who did simulations in 3D. So you take a cloud of atoms in 3D, you come with a plane wave, and then you see uh, f f f some clustering of atoms coming here. Um, what I uh, wanted to uh, highlight as well are experiments which have been done in collective dipole forces, uh, which uh, I like very much. Uh, one experiment has been done by Nir Davidson, uh, <coughs> where he takes a cloud of cold atoms uh, and it comes with a, 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 a plane wave, and then there's a, a, this atoms act like a lens, and then they, the, the, at, the light will get, uh, uh, diverge the, like a lens, and then the atoms will get the recoil of this diverging lens, and then the atoms will uh, have dynamics here, which is uh, collapsing. And this is for, for this to happen, you need many atoms, and so this is a collective dipole force, and uh, this seems to be working on both the tuning side, but okay, we'll probably hear more about this because uh, Jörg Schmidtmeier also did this type of experiments and uh, Phil Passling here in Vienna, and they have uh, uh, also this type of uh, compression forces, and I hope that we hear more about this uh, uh, later in this conference. But uh, these two experiments, uh, for me, is the first experiments in these collective dipole forces, which are very important. Adding on this, we would need to see what heating is doing. That would be very nice. Okay, uh, then another thing connected to astrophysics, which I like very much, is the work by Helmut many years ago about uh, uh, black body radiation. And uh, uh, in some regimes, this uh, mechanical effect of black body radiation can even be stronger than gravitational forces. So that, that's, wow, this is uh, really amazing. Uh, and there's been some testing done in, in some lab experiments on, from this model, but I think Helmut will tell us more about this type of effect. So these two, sets of experiments then uh, for me is really, uh, well, should get much more attention than what it's getting nowadays actually. So I like this very much. Um, with this, wow, I don't even come to random lasing. Um, basically, so what I want to show, tell you is that uh, the random lasing is an effect where uh, you have gain in the volume and losses in the surface. So uh, Stefan Grotta is someone in the room who knows this very well. Uh, we worked with him as well. So we did this in cold atom setting. Okay, so I, I will flash this because I don't have time. We saw random lasing in cold atoms at some point. Yeah, okay, very nice. Uh, and uh, based on this, this was the first uh, random lasing with uh, a gas medium, not in condensed matter. And so this should also work if you had atoms in astro astrophysics. And we know from lasing in general, if you want to detect lasing, let me just flash this uh, um, here. We know from uh, Glauber theory, uh, uh, one important way to make a difference between uh, lasing and non-lasing quantum optics, you need to measure intensity correlation. Just to measure the spectrum, G1 will not tell us if it's just a filtered light or if it's a, a quantum optics light. So, so we need to measure G2. And uh, so what we did uh, recently is, and I will flash all this, unfortunately don't have time to do this, a uh, lot of things. So many people have worked on uh, random lasing in astrophysical context, but only speculations. So someone has to measure it. We are going to measure this, or we hope to measure this. Uh, and we started to do uh, intensity correlations uh, in uh, optical telescopes. So in, uh, now five years ago, we did the first experiment. We see bunching on, on a single telescope. We went to two telescopes close to NIS. Uh, we went to a four meter telescope in Chile. We went to the VLT. Uh, so, uh, uh, since then, uh, other groups uh, with not optical quality telescopes have joined this intensity correlation technique. So now many groups are doing intensity correlation to measure the sizes of stars. So this is getting a developing community again. Um, what we want to do is uh, uh, to measure uh, a quantum genetic Fermi gas. So uh, if, you, if you switch off the fuel in, this, uh, in most of the stars, they will collapse. And then the Fermi pressure of the electrons will balance the gravitational collapse. That's the white dwarf. And the, the, the closest white dwarf we have to us here is uh, Sirius B, uh, which uh, is very close to Sirius A, which is very bright, which we don't want to see, but it's very bright. So right now, Sirius B is quite far away from Sirius A. In 20 years now, it's very close again. So right now, we have, it's a good time to measure Sirius B, magnitude 8, which means not a lot of photons, so it's difficult experiments. But we want to do this experiment, so that's the next challenge. We want to measure the size of Sirius B, to see if all the models for this, uh, the general Fermi gas in astrophysics is, is right. There are co uh, relativity corrections in all these equations. So as a physicist, we have to measure things. There are models, but we have to measure it. And so we have a good hope that we can measure this uh, here. And uh, going for um, intensity correlations, 
uh, there's also some uh, targets where we could uh, hope for random lasing. So we want to measure uh, fairly general gas by looking at the angle, the size of this star, of the white dwarf. And we want, uh, want to measure the optic, quantum optics coming out of Eta Carine, which is one of the best candidates to see random lasing in space. And all this because now we go for uh, astrophysics instruments, at least. That's what we do. Uh, and with this, yeah, I think I uh, thank my team here in Nice and a lot of collaborations. And uh, time is really over. And I um, had to flash already a very interesting random lasing topic. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm here to, for discussions. Thank you for your attention.